action. All right, so here we go. Uh, it's April 28th. Here's the plan for today. So questions, some remarks about homework, uh, a little tiny bit more on the command line, just to give you a sense that we've barely touched the surface. And then we'll talk about Git. So I'll basically show you from start to finish um, all the steps if you wanted to make your own uh, project hosted on GitHub that other people could pull from and push to and so on. Okay, i.e. solve one of the homework problems. So first, are there any general questions? Yes. Uh, for the final project, can I do the group project? Huh? The group, uh, the final project, yep. can I do the group project? How? Like two people do the same project. So you want me to make some more comments on how people can collaborate on a project? Yeah. Okay. Um, can, do you have a specific person that you want to collaborate on? Or with, sorry. Just, just generally. Okay, uh, it, I think it somewhat depends on the project itself that you want to do, the form that collaboration might take. I think it, it depends enormously on the specific project. So if you have like a specific sort of project that you might want to do, then I can answer that more precisely. But uh, it really depends a lot on the sort of project. For example, writing a paper versus working on some code uh, the way collaboration might best work it depends a lot on which it is. Okay. So, what kind of project are you thinking of doing? I might do a, a stock bike specification. Uh huh. So, yeah. So that would probably involve writing some code, but then also writing up some results. Yeah. And so you could divide the tasks between you and another person in a clearly defined way, and then you know, re you know, uh, make sure that the other person's quality is up to snuff. And we, you can run it by me to make sure that it's enough for each person to do. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, how about the main page the first, first draft you have to do? Uh, no. Um, for that, since there's no like requirement about a total amount of stuff that you do and so on, um, or, or very little, it won't be so important. But for the final draft, it will be very important to have a clear uh, division of duties and stuff like that okay. for at least that sort of project. Not all projects would have a division of duties, but I think for that you can come up with something. Um, by the way, there's a library called quantlib, which is the, oops, it's the stand, like the biggest, or it's the most popular open source, geez, I really need to write this. It's the most popular open source library for quantitative trading type stuff and quantitative finance, quantlib, um, and I'm upgrading Sage Math Cloud tonight or tomorrow, or very soon. And one of the things that I'll be adding is good support for Quantlib. So like in a notebook, you'll be able to import a library and get this and so on um, very easily. And I spent a couple of hours on that yesterday. So there'll be good Quantlib support in a day or two. So to your question, yes, Tanner. Um, I just wanted to confirm, I got the slide looking at some of the projects and stuff that we're kind of hoping Yes. Yes. So that still stands for supported. Yep. Although it should have something to do with math. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Um, do I have to use the Python language? Uh, basically, it's the same question he asked, and that's okay. Um, you do not have to use Python for a project. There are other possibilities. Um, what were you thinking of using? It would be hard to use MATLAB. Uh, just because, for example, it's difficult to make the result available to other people to try out because MATLAB isn't free, um, but R is uh, easily available, so, or Octave. No, because then other people wouldn't, they can't take your work and easily replicate it, so that would not be good, I think. Um, unless the code you're writing is so generic that you could you could run it in Octave instead. Um, some MATLAB code can be run in Octave and some can't. But if you just like copy and paste random stuff into Octave sessions, take some screenshots, and then make that your final project so that nobody else can you know replicate what you've done and so on, that's really annoying. And I wouldn't recommend that. I actually refereed a research paper once on modular polynomials and all kinds of stuff. And the author basically did a lot of copying and pasting of random things into Maple and copying and pasting them out to get some tables. And like, 
I just like rejected the paper because I'm like, there's no way I can trust that this, I can't even replicate it. And it's also just lots of copy and pasting. So it's really important when you're you know, doing a calculation that you make something available that other people can run. Uh, but I'm not saying that you didn't suggest you were going to do that. I sort of just guessed. Yes? What language are you thinking of? Uh -huh. I don't have any closed source free languages. I don't think except maybe Cache. There's one called Cache. Believe it or not, I'm sure none of you have heard of it. It is a programming language for math, and it has a funny name which suggests money, but also Germans because of the K. <laughs> and uh, it is closed source and free. <laughs> uh, so there are some. Uh, but most most closed source ones aren't free. Uh, but it's important, yeah, I mean, basically, it's important that the graders, anyone else, can run the code that is part of your project. And if you use MATLAB, it is difficult for other people to run your code. Unless you want to buy everybody a copy of MATLAB. But everybody is <laughs> a large number of people. Okay. Um, next question. Anything? Okay. Okay, homework um, homework four I have collected, and I've also pushed out the directory that has the homework that you're supposed to grade from homework four. Okay, so you should find that in your project. If you don't, let me know as soon as possible. But it should be there in the standard place. Um, also, homework five, I uh, made the assignment on Friday, showed it to you, went over it, and I copied it over to your projects this morning. Um, some people had already copied it into their project. Don't worry, I didn't overwrite your solutions towards homework five with a brand new version. I checked before doing the copy. Uh, okay, any questions about homework? All right, so now our plan today is to do two things. A, just tell you a little bit more about the command line. And then B, go through a complete tutorial involving using Git to set up your own project. And also a little bit of background about Git. Not too much though. Okay, so for the command line, this is really just finishing up some things from the notes from last time. Uh, this is kind of a summary of key things about the command line, and then also some things that I didn't go into much detail about. I'll just show you a few examples. So of course, tab completion on commands and file names is a key feature of the command line that you want to use frequently. You can use patterns to specify files or directories as inputs to these commands. Let me show you an example of that. So here we are at the command line. Um, and I'll make, let's see, today is 28th. Notice, by the way, what happened right there? I hit the tab key. So maybe I can't remember what today is. So I do dot, dot, and I know it's 2004. I know it's April. I hit the tab key. And what it does is it completes it. If you hit the tab key one more time, it should, or actually two more times, it shows you all the options that begin that way. And so then you can type a little bit more, like two, and then you hit the tab key and it does nothing. You hit it again and it shows you um, the options that have a two there, etc. So you can slowly but surely complete your way through to get the date. So I'm hitting the tab key to magically show all this stuff. And Let's see. So if you do something like, uh, so suppose you want to make a couple of files. Let's see. There's a command of the bazillion commands that are available. There's one called touch. And what touch does is it takes a file or multiple files as input. That is, you just list them on the command line. So I'll call them foo bar. You can just give it however many you want, A, B, C, etc. And what it does is it will um, if the files don't exist, it will create them. If they do exist, it will make it so that the last modification time is right now. So now if we type ls to see the files, you'll see that those three files are there. What should I type if I want to know more about the files, like when they were created and how big they are and stuff like that? Right, ls, and then you give an option, ls-l. This is kind of like in a programming language when you have optional inputs to a function. You can think of these commands as being like functions in some big programming language. But it's written differently. Okay, so doing this, you see that 
there are these three files, and they're all created right now. By the way, in Sage Map Cloud, the times are all in UTC, which is uh, kind of like time zone zero. So um, that's why this is in the future. If you look at the snapshot listing, that's right now. And um, a lot of stuff is adjusted to the user. But behind the scenes in the Linux program that's, or the, the Linux OS that's running here, the system clock is said to be only kind of canonical choice, which is UTC. It doesn't adjust to the random person that happens to be looking at it, since it can't really know. OK, so there you are. So we've made three files. And I just want to show you something with patterns. So if I do ls star b star, what that will do is it will it's exactly like I typed every single file that has a b somewhere in its file name. I can see people squinting, so I'll make this bigger. So these are all the files. If I do ls like that, it'll only show, it's literally exactly like if I were to put every file that has a b in it as the inputs to ls. And I see these two. OK, so it's a pattern. You can do other things, though. For example, what if I do this? Uh, b0, b1, b5. That will create three files with those names. If I do ls uh, star b star, then I'm going to see a whole bunch of different files. But you can also do things like this, uh, ls b0 dash 1. And that will show files where the first letter is a b, and the second letter in the file name is a number between 0 and 1. Or if you want to see it, so it's a number between 0 and 9, any number, you can do this. And that's just a tiny bit of what is possible. You can use very sophisticated regular expressions and so on to um, choose your file names, or at least very sophisticated expressions. So um, for example, if you, well, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to show you too much. I just want to give you a hint that there's really an enormous amount you can do with just a few characters at the command line. So that's what I mean by patterns. Um, you can redirect the input or output of a command. So what that means is you can take and run a command and have, instead of the output appearing just right in front of you on the screen, you can make it go to a file itself. Or you could take stuff that's in a file and have that be put as input to a command. So I'll show you a little tiny bit of that. So if we go over here and I type ls-l, so it's going to print out a lot of stuff. It's a bit overwhelming. But let's have it send all of its output to a file, which I will just call output. Um, what this will do is it runs the command, and all output um, gets put in a new file called output. Errors, if there are any, you'll still see those immediately. There's actually two output streams that each command has. Um, standard out and standard error. And this only redirects standard out to the file output. So if I run it, what should I see when I do this? Nothing. Shaking your head. It's going to do, it's going to appear to do nothing. However, if I now type ls, I'll see that there's a new file there called output. And this file should have what I would see if I did ls-l inside of it. Yes? Uh, there, so these are plain text files. Uh, these are empty files, etc. Basically, a file can have. Do you mean like what are the possibilities for a file name? Or because there's you know thousands of different t file types, usually determined by the extension, yeah. just like with other operating systems. Um, is that what you meant? Yeah. Just anything. Uh, I mean, it's any file like. You can put a .exe file here and run it if you use Wine, which I probably don't have installed. Wine is a Windows emulator that, that runs under Linux. Um, yeah, there's just an enormous number of different file types. I think there's a command called type, which you give it a file, and it tells you what its type is. Uh, huh. I didn't. Oh, maybe I have to do. That's weird. It's right there. Uh, I thought it was type. Hmm. Well, there's there's a program called type. Let's see. Man. No, maybe there's. That's weird. I thought. Huh. 
I thought there was a command type that would tell you the type of a file, even if it has some funny extension. We'll try to work it out via some heuristics. A little confused why. Might be a. I don't know, but um, yeah, you can create a million different types of files, but you don't have to put extensions necessarily. Although if you do, then for example, your environment you're working in, like Sage Map Cloud or the desktop or whatever, will know what kind of editor to use to open the file. Um, whereas here, since I didn't give any extension at all, it doesn't know. Um, so we can look at the file output, and you can do that by either opening it in your environment. So that could be open output, and that will open it. We'll see it right here. Okay, here it is. You can also, there are command line tools that let you open that file and look at it. Um, there's a whole bunch of different command line editors, such as Emacs, VI, Heiko, etc. Um, so for example, you could type VI output, and that shows you the file, and you're in some editor that will probably annoy you a lot, because to exit it, you type colon Q bing. Um, you can type Emacs output, and you get into another editor, which takes a long time to start up, but here it is. Um, you can type pico output. These are all editors that you can run. It's very valuable to know about these if you ever end up, if you want to run a computer on some cluster, you connect into it, and then you need to edit just a little bit some file. And you don't want to have to like copy the file back and forth to edit it. So you can use one of these programs. Pico is one of the easiest to use because it has very few options, and they're all listed more or less at the bottom of the screen. So, um, and these carrots mean control. So if I want to write the file, I do control O. If I want to exit, I do control X, etc. And I don't want to save my little change. You can also type more and then give the file name, and that will just directly display it right there on the screen. And there you are. Um, That's a bummer. It used to be that typically more was a symbolic link to a different program called less. And then people would joke and say more is less. But apparently not. OK, so uh, that shows you how to take anything you want, like ls, whatever, and then send its output to a file. OK, so just to review that, all I did was do ls, gave some options, and I used a caret symbol that redirects the output to a file. You can also um, give, make input to a command come from a file, but I haven't shown you any commands yet that actually take input. So, um, but there is one, say Sage. So Sage, you can use as a command line program. Notice it's sitting there waiting for input. So let's do the following. Let's think of some input that you would type to Sage, put it in a file, and then use the same method to uh, make this work. So, uh, I want to put something, I want to put something really simple, 2 plus 3 in a file. So there's a command called echo that takes as input a string, and then all it does is just output that string again. But what would happen if you put a little caret symbol, I mean a little greater than symbol right after that, and then put a file name? That output would go into the file. So watch. If I do echo 2 plus 3 and I put it into um, a file, then that creates a file whose contents are 2 plus 3. So now I've made a file with those contents in just one line. So I've very quickly made a file. Um, and now what I can do is go sage and then do a file. And notice I put the arrow the other way this time. What just happened is that instead of sage taking its input from the user typing at the keyboard, it takes its input from that file. It's as if you typed exactly the contents of that file into Sage, and notice that a 5 appeared in the output right there. Uh, there's probably a dash Q option to Sage. Often programs have options that make them you know, avoid printing a banner and stuff like that. So you can see that at least dash Q got rid of the banner. There's a lot of annoying output and stuff here, which can be a problem. You want to take the output of this and now do something else with it. Can you redo the left symbol? It would be a completely different thing. Um, well, then Sage will run the code in the file if it ends in .sage. Since it doesn't end in .sage, though, it probably would, uh, it might work, I don't know. It probably, it's not a good idea. Um, 
But what this does, this is a completely general construction that works in any command line, uh, fun any command line program. It just takes you get any command line program and then a less than symbol and then a file. And then all the input that would be typed to that command line program comes from the file instead. And you can also combine these. So you could do this and then uh, and the output. You won't see anything at all as long as there are no errors. If there's an error, you would have saw something. And now if we do more the output, you see the output is right there. OK? So it's pretty powerful, um, as you might imagine. But it allows you to script uh, complicated things. OK, there's another thing to show you, which is, uh, so I was redirecting the input or output. You can also combine together things using pipes, which is the vertical, um, it's a, on an American keyboard, it's shift and then backslash. So it's like a, looks like a vertical line. And I'll show you how it works. Yes? Is there an order of operations for the, the arrows? Uh, I don't think it matters because it just completely, no, it, it, it commutes because, um, yeah, there's, you mean like an association? I don't think it, it matters because it's just like either all of the output goes to that file or none of it. All the input comes from the file or none of it. So it wouldn't matter if you which order you did it in. Like for the example you just did, yep. how did it know um, that A should just go directly to that input? Um, you mean right here? It's just, so it, what this says is, the first part says all, when you run this command, all the input comes from that file. Just take the standard input stream and it's that file. And then it says, and when you run the command also, the standard output stream should instead be this file right here. And it just does that right bef like before it actually runs the commands. It sets the standard in and standard output streams to be these instead of the screen. Basically. And it actually, the screen and you typing are viewed by everything as files, just like everything else is. Uh, like the program doesn't really know much of a difference between the screen, especially for output, and a file. They're completely the same as far as the program's concerned. And by the way, inside of Python, that's also true in that, uh, let's see, or, or in Sage, the input and output that you see, that's really just sys.standard out. That's a file like object, and you can write to it. And then do, and there it is, and it just appears there. So it's kind of abstracted. It's a way of you have a question on the far end? OK. All right. Uh, so let me show you an example with the pipe. So if you do, um, what the pipe does is it takes the standard out from one command, that is where the output is going to go, and makes it the standard in for the next command. So it's exactly. It's more or less just like running a command and redirecting all the output into a file, then taking and running another command and making the input come from that same file. Okay? So remember, before what I did was I said echo 2 plus 3 into a file, and then I did sage a file. Okay? And I got 5 out. I'm going to combine those two things into a single line using a pipe. All I do is do echo 2 plus 3 pipe sage. And it's basically the same. These two things are basically the same. Um, it's a little different though because there at the top it's going to wait until a file is closed. In other words, it waits until that command is completely done before it starts doing the next one. Whereas with the pipe at the bottom, as output appears, from the thing on the left, the output gets consumed from the thing on the right. But this construction is incredibly powerful. There are, um, I mean, if you know about the various other tools that are available. But just to give you an example, there's a command find. If you say find space dot, it will list every single file in every subdirectory of the current directory. OK? So when I hit the return key, it's going to just bunch of files are going to appear, all right? Boom. All the files and all subdirectories, even hidden files, everything gets displayed. There's another command called grep, which takes a file and will show you only the lines that match a certain pattern. 
So if I pipe this into grep and then give some pattern, so remember what this is going to do is it will list every file in this directory or any subdirectory, and then the output of that, which is a list of file names, will now be the input to another command, which is called grep, which is the GNU regular expression search. And what this will do is it lists the lines in the file of input that match a given pattern. So let's make the pattern something like, just something simple like backup. And then we see only the files that match, and we get a nice highlighted output. Or we could say, I want to see only the files that have 2014 in them. And there they are. And you can even move up one directory, and we'll see quite a bit. This should just, when I hit return, there should be so many files that it just flies by, and I'll show you how to deal with that. So notice again, I'm not typing very much. What this is going to do is show me all files and all subdirectories whose file name contains this pattern. And where I want to emphasize, if you want to get really powerful with using this stuff, you can come up with, you could say the file starts with 2014. You could say the third digit of the file, or the third letter of the file is a number between 0 and 4. That sort of thing. Very, very complicated expressions. Things that are uh, hard to do otherwise. So a bunch of stuff uh, went by. Well, how do you deal with that? You can pipe again into the program more. What more is, is it's a pager, so it'll show you the contents of a file, but if it's about to go off the screen, it gives you a little bar and it says, hey, please you know, hit the space bar to see more. That's why it's called more. So now I'm combining together three separate commands, and this is the result. It shows me all the files that contain 2014 in them in the current directory or any subdirectory, and I have a pager that lets me page through the results, as you can see. Or you could say, oh, I want to see all the stupid files. And there you are. So this is just a few characters. It's kind of like calling a function, getting back a result, and then calling a function on that, getting back a result, and then calling a function on that. Except it all kind of gets, happens at once, in that as soon as Byte starts outputting files, they get input to grep. Grep starts searching through this stuff, and as soon as it starts seeing stuff, you start seeing them. So it's kind of really nice. I mean, it probably looks pretty weird, but just command some arguments, a vertical bar, which pipe, it looks like a pipe. It means all the outputs of that command become the input. They become the standard input stream of the next command. Then the standard out of the next command becomes the standard in of the following command. And you can pipe together a whole bunch of these. And again, this stuff has been around for like 40 years, available everywhere, extremely debugged and useful. And grep isn't just a command that takes one argument. If you look at the man page for grep, it'll go on for pages and pages. It has everything implemented you can pretty much imagine related to finding lines in a file, and then debugged, and then debugged, debugged, and triple debugged by a million people. Not a million, but a few people over the years. So you type man grep, look, I mean, it's just... There's a lot going on here. You're like, you're like, hmm, I wonder, I want to find all the lines that don't contain something. It's just an option, dash I. I want it to be case, or dash D actually. You want it to be case insensitive, that's another option, dash I. You want it to print out extra stuff about the line number, where it finds the match, that's dash N. Um, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on, 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 and on. Holy crap. Okay. And then there's some C also stuff at the bottom. And so. Here you are. Okay, so that's combining commands together via pipes. Um, there are other things like if a command's running and it's taking a while, you can hit Control Z and it pauses the command. And then you can type BG and it puts it in the background. You can type jobs and it'll list all the commands that are running in the background. And and bring certain ones into the foreground. There's all kinds of things you can do. It's like a, a full operating system, kind of like what you have in the graphical interface, um, but it's purely at the command line. And again, if you're going to run things on supercomputers, remote clusters, anything like that, um, this will make you massively more productive, knowing about the command line. And there are millions, well, thousands and thousands of commands. Let's see. Let's see how many commands there are in user bin, which is typically where they're located. So if I type ls, I wanted to list the um, 
commands one per in one column. So there's an option dash one. So I'm going to get a huge list out. So if I want to know how many lines are in that list, what sort of thing might I do? I'm not expecting you to know the exact command to use, but I want to, okay. This is going to output a huge list of command names, things that are in the directory user bin. Let's say I want to know how many things are in there. I want to count them. Any ideas as far as what I might do? What sort of construction might I use? Yes? Uh, oh, yeah, okay. So he said, use the pipe command. And then he happens to know that there's a command called wc for word count. And then you can say dash L and it'll only count the lines. And it gives you a number, 2,418. And so, by the way, like if you want to know how many files contain stupid or in their file name or 2014, instead of putting more here, when you page to the files, you just replace more by wc-l. And instead, it would output a single number, namely how many lines have that property. So, it, so that's pretty powerful. Um, there's also another command, proc, which allows you to do really complicated stuff, kind of like grep, where you select lines with certain properties and do things with them. Um, it's kind of an awkward name, but it's the it's the uh, first letter or the let's see. There's three people. The W is Weinberger, who worked at AT and T for a long time, works at Google now, and K and A. There are three um, computer people from the old days, and I guess they wrote this program together. But um, it's just like a humble little program. But the sort of queries you can do with it are incredibly sophisticated. Um, queries on the lines of output from another command. Etc. Okay, so that is the taste of the command line that I want to show you. Um, these are some of my favorite commands: sage, git, man, find, etc. All right, so now we're done with the very basics of the command line, and now we'll start talking about git. And the only other thing to say about the command line is there's an enormous amount of other things you could say about the command line. Um, and this is a summary of what I just told you. So. Pipes, carrots, etc. All right, so now let's start talking about Git, and we'll talk about it today and certainly on Wednesday as well. Um, Here's the description of Git that you find on at the it's Git website. Git is a free and open source distributed version control system designed to handle everything from small to very large projects with speed and efficiency. And a quick summary of the history of Git is the following. Um, Linus Torvalds and the Linux kernel development team were using a revision control system, which uh, was not really open source in the same way that programs like Sage and Linux are open source. So they found it very useful, but um, it had various restrictions as far as how it could be used. It was, um, they got into some big conflicts with the people that were developing it. And this pissed Linus Torvalds off. And he went off and he wrote Git from scratch. Um, and what it, its original target application was supposed to be a revision control system or source control system for the Linux kernel. So people working on the Linux kernel would have their code, like each time they make changes, they would check them in to Git, and they would share them amongst each other using Git. It's a program that lets you collaborate on, mainly its initial goal is to collaborate on source code development. Although people also use it for writing papers and all kinds of other things. Um, example, I guess Facebook. So you guys know about Facebook. It's a huge program. And I saw a quote from a slide a couple of days ago which said that Facebook has something like a 40 gigabyte Git repository. So they have all of their code for the entire project as one absolutely enormous Git repository, which probably means little to you, but it will mean a lot more in the book. Um, they maybe have the biggest, most complicated Git repository out there. It's completely crazy. OK, so here's why you might want to learn Git. First, uh, at least among open source software, it's the most popular revision control system. So if you want to contribute to some open source project um, or start your own and you want people to be comfortable with the choice of revision control system you use, then this is the one to use. Um, 
I wish I had known that it would be the most popular revision control system when I made various choices in the past. A lot of pain resulted from not knowing that would be the case. Uh, when I started Sage, I don't think it existed. And then uh, I, for the first year, we or the first two years, we used a program called Darks, which is written in Haskell, but it's a similar distributed revision control system. Um, but it ends up ended up sort of waning in popularity and having some major issues. Then we started using, then I chose Mercurial, which is a competitor to Git in about 2007. So I thought Mercurial would be the, the way to go. Turns out I was wrong and we had to switch to Git, which took about a year of work overall to do. It's a very painful experience, but it's done. Um, second reason, Sage uses Git. So if you want to contribute anything at all to Sage, then you need to learn Git. <coughs> You don't have to learn a lot of Git, you need to learn something about Git. Um, and that, again, that's the case for many, many open source projects. Finally, Git, knowing Git could save your apps. By which I mean the following. So, some of you may have uh, worked on a document or a collection of documents for some project or something, and you wanted to save backups, or you wanted to save a particular version. So you made a file, you had a file which is project, and you had another file which is project and the date. And another file with, you know, like basically you have a whole bunch of copies of a file with different file names based on the date or other properties. Has anyone ever done that? I've certainly done that a lot. That was the revision control system for the first eight months of Sage. Um, it was just tarballs given with some name and stuff like that. Um, and then suddenly you remember for sure that you had some, you know, Excel spreadsheet or something that let you create a certain figure and you just can't find it. And so you spend all day trying to find it and you can't. And so then you spend a lot of time recreating it from scratch. Maybe it takes a day or two to get everything back to where you think it should be. Because um, that happens when you're backing up a whole project and you're just making random like copies all over the place. It can be really hard to have like a linear chain of what happened and to know exactly when a given thing happened. Um, or when you made a certain change to a file or when a given line changed. What, what, at what moment in time did a given line in the file change? Who changed that line in the file, etc. You run into questions like this. Git solves these problems very well. It also solves the problem that you have um, a file on several different computers and different states, and you want to merge them all, make them all in a consistent state. And you want to merge them in a sensible way, such that if there's a conflict, it lets you explicitly resolve the conflict, showing you the, two ver the exact place where it wasn't 100% clear how to resolve the conflict, shows you the two choices, and then you can choose the one that you think is right. You can manually do the parts that you should need to do. Um, unlike, say, Dropbox, which come, tries to do this sort of thing, but when it gives up, it just says conflicted copy, and you end up with multiple copies of the same document, which is painful. Um, but Git lets you have 50 different people working on a single file, and you can merge them together at your leisure at a specific point in time, resolve things, bounce things back, etc. It solves a lot of problems that everybody runs into when they're collaborating on a project, possibly just with themselves at a future point in time. Because you're always collaborating on a project, Unless the project gets instantly done, the second you start, you're collaborating on it with yourself in the future. So basically, you have two choices. You can either learn to use Git, which will take you a day or so to learn the basics of Git, or you can spend a day or so several times over your life feeling stupid as you recreate something that you accidentally messed up. Is Sage not on Git? Yes. Although so, some of the code is open source and some of the code isn't open source of Sage Math Cloud itself. So, um, but it's all hosted on GitHub. If you want access to the non-open source stuff, talk to me and I can give you access. Um, synchronization I already mentioned. Um, here's another reason to learn Git. You want to get a job after you graduate? Here's some companies that are using Git in projects, like Google, Facebook, etc. All right, so now my next goal, which obviously I won't finish in five minutes, is a very basic Git tutorial from start to finish of making a project um, just in a terminal or with the graphical browser. Then making it so that project is, is hosted on some third-party site, we'll use GitHub, and then pulling it to another location, making some additional changes, pushing, etc. So I'll show you kind of the life cycle of how you work on a collection of code. Okay, so let's start here. We're going to make a new project called example, and those are the commands we type. So we'll, this is how you do it from the terminal. Um, you type mkdir to make a directory. You change into that directory, 
and you type git init, and that will create the extra files that you need. So let me do that. Um, I'm going to go into the directory for today's lecture. Git uh, make directory example, cd example, git init. Initialized empty git repository. If I type ls-a, it'll show all files in the current directory. What happens when you type git init, which you're running the git command, it has an argument. And arguments don't have to be file names. It can be, like, you can basically have all kinds of things that go here. Init is a subcommand, which itself could take a whole bunch of options. There's help for it, etc. Git has an enormous amount of very good help. There's lots of books on it, etc. And it's extremely fast as well. It deals with huge code bases efficiently. Um, the snapshot system for SageMap Cloud uses Git behind the scenes. So it deals with large files. Uh, but in any case, what this does is it takes a directory and it endows it with a magic subdirectory called .git. And that's where Git stores it all in its state. Notice, it didn't require any account. It didn't connect to any remote machine. It's all local right there on your computer at first. So Git is a distributed revision control system. You don't have to check stuff out from some computer somewhere else or anything like that to use it. You can purely, privately, to yourself, track files, check in things, make snap, I mean, basically you can do everything all locally. But at some point, you'll probably want to push your changes elsewhere so that other people can pull them or so they're backed up better. So I've showed you one command so far, and that's it. Now we're going to create a file and add it to be tracked by Git. Okay, so we can make a file. I could either create it with a graphical interface or whatever, but um, I'll just use that, uh, I'll use echo. So my neat file, I'll just call it some file. Oops. Okay, so now if I type ls-a, this shows all files in the current directory. And now there's this file, some file. And what I'll do is I'll add it so that it's um, being tracked by git. So you do git add and the file name. This is another git subcommand add. There's an enormous number of these. And what it does is it says, hey git, watch the changes I make to this file. Allow me to check them in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it just silently says it's done. Now if you type git status, uh, what it will do is it'll show information about what's going on here. It says that there is a change that can be committed um, and it's that we created a new file called some file and uh, it tells us some other information about branches and so on. By the way, another thing that Git makes very easy to do, even if you have enormous amounts of code and so on, let's say you, you're working on a program or something and you have a crazy idea and you just want to try it out. And so what you do is you make what's called a new branch and then you can try it out and if it doesn't work, you can just switch back to the original one. It makes it very easy to switch between several different things without losing any of your work, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so if we do git commit, ah, um, let's see, and I'll go, yeah, just git commit I think will do it. Maybe I have to do dash a, although it already says to be committed, so I think I can just do that. Yep. So I said git space commit, and it puts me in an editor. Um, which editor you get will depend on your project. The default is Pico, which is that one that's really, really easy to use. I have mine set up to use VI. Uh, and then you type a message describing what you've just done. So um, I added a file. And then you save it, and there you are. So now if you do git status, there's nothing to be committed. If you type git log, it will show a list of everything that you've committed, every commit that you've done so far as given. So I've done exactly one commit, and each of these has a lot of additional information associated to it that you don't see. And you can do things like show me the state of the file when I made that commit, show me what changes were recorded in making an additional commit, etc. So let's do something. Let's change the file and then commit that. So our file says my neat file. So let's change it to say my messy file. 
And now if I do get status, it'll notice that something's been changed. So I've modified that file, and it has some hints. Um, nothing's changed, nothing is staged to be committed, but if I do git add and then put that file there, then when I do git commit, it'll save it. It'll save the new version. I can also do git diff, or else I like the color option. That shows me the differences between what I have saved already and what I'm doing right now. So imagine a more complicated scenario. Instead of changing one line, you have some code that you've been working on. You committed it right before you started, and you're doing all these changes, and you say git diff dash dash color. And it's going to show you line by line exactly what changes you just made. And then you can decide, hey, I do want to save those, or no, I don't, or maybe I want to save them somewhere else or whatever. Um, if you Once you get used to using this program for tracking your code, you'll think that there's no possible way you could write any non-trivial code without using it. And it would be totally insane to do so. And when you see people that write code without using a revision control system like Git, you will just feel very sorry for them and sad for them. So let's commit the, the change. I can say dash A to commit everything that's changed. And um, I'll say more changes. And there you are. And when I say git log, it shows uh, a message for each commit. And what this, you can think of this as the complete state of all the files at that moment in time. But with a comment and with lots and lots of tools for showing differences between two states in time. And also you can do this whole like this sequence of changes of the thing, but in, you have a whole bunch of different branches. It's very sophisticated. And you have a whole bunch of different people doing the same thing at once as well. Okay, we'll continue next time on Wednesday with a further tutorial on Git. Which file did you save once? Okay, so it's in it's uh, safe underscore server dot py. Yeah, yeah, that one right there. Thank you. It imports another. It imports some other py files in here, so you might want to just copy. Copy it out. I would recommend making a new directory and then copying all the .py files from here okay. to that new directory, which you can do very easily on the command line. Let's call it server. So that makes a directory in your home directory yeah. called server. And you can do copy star.py server. Awesome. Thank you. And then open. So you, yep, that's the directory. You should tell them that they'll Oops. also be sorry when they start working at a company that forces you to use SVN because oh. our server team sucks. By the way, the I should make that the default using your browser default because otherwise uh, the web-based Troy fonts that is now it's lined up properly. Oh, nice. Yeah, and it uses your browser default. So now if you change whatever you like for. Uh, mono space is now what it uses. So awesome. you could easily adjust it. Thanks. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would love to have the Sage Math font. My web development skills kind of suck. What? My web development skills kind yeah. of suck. Well, um, yeah, check out the server stuff. It's, uh, I think there's a lot of possibility with it. And the hard part, a lot of it was just like getting input to be evaluated and then catching the output as it appears. That sort of thing. That's all done. Yeah. And very well debugged. I work on a concur technologies. Uh -huh. We do nice. like travel and expense stuff. Cool. I'm going to TechCrunch Disrupt over the weekend too. Awesome. Where's and that in, at in this time? New York? Nice. Are you guys presenting like, there? Yeah, we're like a sponsor. We're trying to get developers to use our APIs. 